reading through the Bible in a year. February 19th, Exodus chapter 2, Luke 5, Job 19, and 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Now a man from the house of Levi went and took as a wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and pitch. And she put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the riverbank. And his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, while her young women walked beside the river. And she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman, and she took it. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son, and she named him Moses, because, she said, I drew him out of the water. One day, when Moses had grown up, he went out to his own people and looked on their burdens, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. And he looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. When he went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together. And he said to the man in the wrong, Why do you strike your companion? He answered, Who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, Surely the thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Now the priests of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. The shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and saved them and watered their flock. When they came home to their father, Reuel, he said, How is it that you have come home so soon today? They said, An Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds, and even drew water for us, and watered the flock. And he said to his daughters, Then where is he? Why have you left the man? Call him, that he may eat bread. And Moses was content to dwell with the man, and he gave Moses his daughter, Zipporah. She gave him, rather, she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Gershom. For he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. During those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God. God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. There's all the notes to hear. Move on now to Luke chapter 5. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of, uh, rather had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let out your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night, which is when you're supposed to go fishing, and took nothing, but at your word, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they enclosed enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink When Simon Peter saw this, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. 
And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. When they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. While he was in one of the cities, there came a man full of leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you, excuse me, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. And he charged him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing, as Moses commanded, for a proof to them. But now even more the report about him went abroad, and great uh, crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. But he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. On one of those days, as he was teaching, Pharisees and the teachers of the law were sitting there, who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with him to heal. And behold, some men were bringing him uh, on a bed, a man who was paralyzed. And they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus, but finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him uh, down with his bed through the tiles in the midst of Jesus. They're into the midst before Jesus. When he saw their faith, he said, Man, your sins are forgiven you. The scribes and Pharisees began to question, saying, Who, who is this who speaks blasphemies? For who can forgive sins but God alone? When Jesus perceived their thoughts, remember, he didn't hear them saying this. They were reasoning in themselves. So now he's responding to their thoughts. Something only God can do. He answered them, Why do you question in your hearts? Which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven you. Or to say, Rise and walk. But, that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He turned and said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And immediately he rose up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home, glorifying God. An amazement seized them all, and they glorified God and were filled with awe, saying, We have seen extraordinary things today. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his house. There was a a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with them. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat with tax collectors? Or rather, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? If if you're so holy, why are you mingling with those people? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. They said to him, The disciples of John fast often and offer prayers, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours eat and drink. Jesus said to them, Can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. He also told them a parable. No one tears a piece uh, from a new garment and puts it onto an old garment. If he does, he will tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins, and it will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. And no one, after drinking old wine, desires new for... He says, the old is good. Showing here that he's introducing a new thing before them. Now, Job 19. Then Job answered his friend, Bildad the Shuhite, and said, How long will you torment me and break me in pieces with words? 
These ten times you have cast reproach upon me. Are you not ashamed to wrong me? And even if it be true that I have erred, my error remains with myself. If indeed you magnify yourselves against me and make my disgrace an argument against me, know then that God has put me in the wrong and closed his net about me. Behold, I cry out violence. I am not answered. I call for help. There is no justice. He has walled up my way so that I cannot pass. He has set darkness upon my paths. He has stripped me from, or rather, he has stripped me from my glory and taken the crown from my head. He breaks me down on every side and I am gone. In my hope, he has pulled up like a tree. He has kindled his wrath against me and counts me as his adversary. His troops come on together, and they have cast up their siege ramp against me and encamp around my tent. He has put my brothers far from me, and those who knew me are wholly estranged to me. My relatives have failed me. My close friends have forgotten me. The guests in my house are my maidservant, rather, the guests in my house and my maidservants count me as a stranger. I become a foreigner in their eyes. I call to my servant, but he gives me no answer. I must plead with him, with my mouth for mercy. My breath is strange to my wife, and I am a stench to the children of my own mother. Even young children despise me. When I rise, they talk against me. All my intimate friends abhor me, and those whom I loved have turned against me. My bones stick to my skin and to my flesh. I have scraped, uh, rather I have escaped by the uh, skin of my teeth. Have mercy on me, have mercy on me, O you my friends, for the hand of God has touched me. Why do you, like God, pursue me? Why are you not satisfied with my flesh? Oh, that my words were written, that they were inscribed in a book. Oh, that with an iron pen and lead, they were engraved in the rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer lives. And I know that at the last, he will stand upon the earth. After my skin has been, rather, has been thus destroyed. Yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. If you say, how will we pursue him? And the root of the matter is found in him. Be afraid of the sword, for wrath brings the punishment of the sword, that you may know that there is a judgment. All the notes to hear. Let's conclude today in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Paul continues When one of you have a, has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? If the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there's no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? 
Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. Now this next section here, there's a lot of questions as to what it is he's responding to. You'll see that he's quoting them or quoting common sayings in Corinth at the time. Um, But remember that these people are overly indulging in their uh, Christian liberty. So, Paul talked about this before in Romans 14. I, I, I love that section of text. Because it really resolves a lot of these questions and concerns about how it is that we interact with other people who are Christians. How do we handle somebody who, for all intents and purposes, as far as we can tell, is an honest, believing Christian, but they're they're not serving God as we would have them serve God, right? And so, that tells us how we should handle those things, how we should endure it, yes, but also how we should allow God to lead those people through what he's going to lead them through. Maybe we are deceived and they're not really Christians. Or maybe God is leading them through something to teach them something so they can be a better witness to other people in a way that you and I can't be. We can't know that. All we can know is that we must serve our God in all that we are and all that we do. So, How does that tie into this? The end of Romans 14, Paul declares that he will not put a stumbling block before other Christians simply because of his uh, Christian liberty. And he uses food as an example. So, he knows that demons don't exist. Sorry, he knows that demons do exist. He knows that idols don't have a real God behind them. These idols are as nothing. It literally is a nothing. Great people will get that. And because it's a nothing, right? He knows that what they're worshiping is they're worshiping demons, right? Who are just simply fallen angels. They have no bearing in this relationship. He knows that the the people of God will judge the angels. We just read that. And we know that the demons are uh, are already judged. So, when someone goes and, you know, uh, when a a pagan person, a non-Christian goes and sacrifices to one of these idols. They sacrifice the animal, and sometimes there's meat left over, and that gets sold in the marketplace. And sometimes after the meat's been roasted, they se- they sell that in the marketplace as well. It's better to do that than to let it go to waste. All the money goes back to the temple, but, you know, whatever. They're just worshiping whatever they want to. Living their best life now. Um, but... The meat's going to be thrown away regardless if, if it doesn't get purchased. Because we know that these things that they worship are nothing. And yeah, they can tell us, oh, this was sacrificed to, to, to the great goddess Diana or, you know, whoever it happens to be. And, you know, we would um, supposedly get some sort of power or some sort of blessing from eating this, you know, whatever hunk of meat. Um, but a bacon cheeseburger is a bacon cheeseburger. And he knows that there's no power or anything in that food. So, with all of that, he knows that to be true. 
but for the sake of the younger brothers and sisters in Christ. He chooses not to lord it over them. Because if you, as a younger brother or sister in Christ, it, let's say you grew up in a very idolatrous family. And so for you, right now, God has you at a point where it is abhorrent to you to eat anything that was sacrificed to, to one of these idols, to one of these false gods. So, because it's sin for you, I'm basically recapping what I said in Romans 14, but because it is sin for you to do that, why would I, as a more mature Christian who understands the the, the legal side of these things, why would I put you into a situation where it, it leads you into sin if you choose to violate your God-given conscience and to partake in something that I have Christian liberty in? The Corinthians, on the other hand, are doing the exact opposite of that. They're basically lording it over people, laughing about the fact that, well, we have all of these freedoms in Christ, because we're good Christians, you see. Therefore, we're going to partake in all of these things and the, under the banner of Christian liberty. And if you have a problem with that, that's just your thing. That's the background behind where we are here. Looking back up in verse 12. Quote, all things are lawful for me. Unquote. Again, that may have been something that they were saying, or it may have been a, a standard thing that was common in Corinth at the time. So he's using their cultural example as something to respond to them with. And he'll do that repeatedly throughout the rest of this text. All things are lawful for me, he quotes, but not all things are helpful. He replies, all things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Another quote, food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. This isn't specifically meant to talk about food. The point of this statement is actually to speak about the sexual organs. <laughs> They've only got the one purpose, so you may as well use them. That's why you have them. It's the intent that they're giving. He replies, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. We talked about this before. The reason why God created us was to bring him Glory. Not so we can live it to our own best life now. Uh, now. Not so we can um, pursue whatever it is that our hearts desire. Verse 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a prostitute? That way? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute in that way becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have received from, rather, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Telling you, this is a spicy letter. It's a spicy letter of correction to the people. And so many people, especially when we get to um, chapter 11, uh, so many people will uh, gleefully um, just read through this text or 
perhaps 14 or 13, and, and they'll just gleefully read through the text like, oh, it's a, such a... No, you've got to understand the context. That's what we're doing here today. All right, that is all the reading and all of the notes. God willing, we'll be back tomorrow. Behold, word of the Lord.